Hello, Barcelona, and hello, the Sidim. Uh, welcome to the to the panel of uh, artificial intelligence, uh, artificial, yeah, artificial artificial intelligence for uh, collective intelligence. Uh, as you know, I think this is the topic of the year. Uh, artificial intelligence, it's not really new. However, uh, current advances are making us ask uh, on what occasions is artificial intelligence correct to be implemented in a public, uh, in a, in, you know, in a, in a public case. Uh, so in this panel, we are gonna, we have actually two really good uh, speakers who are gonna present probably very different uh, takes on this topic. Uh, so I wanna start by introducing uh, Xavier Baranderan. Uh, he is actually, he's a doctor of philosophy, a fellow philosopher, and he's also a founder of the Decidim project. So a lot of the ideological uh, takes that Decidim has is thanks to somebody like Xavi. Uh, so uh, Xavi is like his specialty is uh, the intersection between cognitive sciences and complex systems, obviously collaborative innovation and participatory democracy, so well, very well suited. And I will also present uh, Robert Bjornsson. Uh, he, well, he's an entrepreneur uh, who introduced the web in Iceland in 1993 and Denmark in 1995. And he, uh, in 2008, he founded the Citizen Foundation, uh, an, an NGO uh, that centered on participatory uh, democracy and digital democracy. So, very good company and just let's do a round of applause for them. Thank you. <laughs> So uh, in this panel, like uh, each of them are going to present their very theoretical and practical uh, takes on AI for democracy. Uh, and I, we want to start with Xavi, please. Thank you, Ali. Let me see if we can, okay. Hey, this is too much, <laughs> not yet, <laughs> not yet, oh my God. It's, um, I'm going to talk about religion because, you know, I, I've been, reading about artificial intelligence for a very long time, more than 20 years, uh, and it's so complex. Now it's becoming so sophisticated. It's even hard to keep track of all the publications, all the innovations every week. Uh, it's a new technology that is changing everything forever for everybody. Uh, and it's quite difficult, and I was trying to think, how can I democratize uh, an introductory discourse on artificial intelligence uh, to a b wide audience, and I could only come with religious metaphors, and, but they make sense. And there are two ways of approaching religion. One is uh, th theologians and, and true believers in, in religions, right? Uh, in, in God, so that's it, it typically in our societies, some people believed in God, so some still do. Uh, and some still do so much, they, they're ready to bomb other people because of gods and shit. But uh, most of us don't. Uh, but the new gods, the new artificial intelligence, has a lot of believers. Uh, priests, and Elon Musk is, is one of them, obviously. Uh, the transhumans, they believe they can, at some point, uh, merge with super artificial intelligence and so on. And uh, well, whenever I give a talk at the Sedim Fest, I, I talk to somebody from um, Silicon Valley. So this time is Elon Musk. Elon, don't take this personally. Um, but uh, the, 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 the true believers think that we are at some point going to merge with artificial intelligence. And I don't think that's a bad idea for Elon Musk himself. I mean, <laughs> you know, because if he wants to upload his mind to a computer, well, maybe we can put it in a simulation in one corner, right? And we can have our uh, life uh, independently. And at some point, we can unplug the computer as well, but he won't realize, it's too, too late. But he has a plan B, which is go to Mars as well, which is, you know, is also very good, because we won't have to share this planet with him anymore. <laughs> and so Elon Musk, just don't stop, just go ahead with your, with your dreams. I think you have to pursue that. Uh, there is one way, one different way of, of uh, thinking about religion, and that's uh, the approach of sociologists, philosophers, activists, post-human or humanists, just people that you know are flesh and blood, and they acknowledge that uh, the gods are there as a social system, if you want, but uh, we have to be critical of them. And I take uh, Timnit Jebru and 
she should be here actually, not not, not uh, Robert, not only perhaps Robert and me, but you know. Uh, and um, people that take a more critical approach to artificial intelligence, and I'm gonna try to be on that, uh, on that team. There are, there's one more species, more, one more relationship with religion and technology, and this is Peter Thiel, right? This is super dangerous people. This is like, you know these uh, um, bishops that don't believe in God, but they are super into the, you know, in the power of Vatican? Uh, and this is a good example. This is Peter Thiel, he, he was a, a friend of, El they're probably still friends. Um, and I don't think he believes in God that much, but he, he controls the Silicon Valley uh, Vatican uh, power with artificial intelligence in between. Anyway, uh, let's go to, so what is, what is my, my goal today? What, what I'm gonna do? I could, I'm gonna try to explain what is artificial intelligence and especially large language models and transformers because it's important to understand some of the internal workings of that. Um, then I'm gonna try to show how all human intelligence is actually artificial. So there is, the, they're selling us a product with a hype as capitalism always does I think it's important, there are very inf important transformations coming, but uh, we should uh, step aside and, and take awareness of how all of human intelligence is artificial and is collective, and how artificial intelligence, as we are sold uh, as a product, is a form of collective intelligence, right? And then I'm gonna go into theology and sociology of, uh, of religion to see how, well, we have new gods and they're not going to go away. Uh, but they're not completely alive, so there is a lot of uh, spoilers here. So just please don't, don't, this is like a trailer. If you analyze too much a trailer, the whole story breaks apart. So just listen a bit and, and then forget about it. Uh, but we have to learn a lot from the old uh, societies and civilizations ha and how they dealt with, with the arrival of new gods and the relationship between religion and politics and uh, knowledge. And, and then I'm going to finish with some... Uh, uh, reflections of the book that we will publish soon, but it's a, this is a secret as well, and, and I shouldn't have mentioned this, uh, where we dedicate a few pages to the interaction between the CDM and artificial intelligence, like potential future avenues of uh, research and uh, development. So what is artificial intelligence? Uh, if I had a story, I teach these things, and, and it's too much. I'm, I'm just going to explain that uh, I did program my first neural network 22 years ago, and it was an exercise about um, predicting the price of housing. Yeah, I I, I wasn't the smartest guy uh, on the on the on the master's degree, and but I passed the exam. Uh, but I was poor, I still am. And but uh, uh, amazingly, it was 20 years ago, 22 years ago. It was possible to predict the evolution of, of the market. If, if I had the money to invest, I'll, I wouldn't be here. I'd be rich and playing golf or something. Um, and, and so to speak, artificial intelligence been here for decades, right? Serving the rich people. <laughs> the big difference now is that uh, there's artificial intelligence for the masses, right? With chat GPT and so on. Uh, but in fact, artificial intelligence has been there for, for more than 20 years. It's been there from the very beginning of computer science. Uh, Alan Turing, and his uh, universal Turing machine uh, was, was just followed by an, ar an article on, on whether machines could be intelligent. One of the oldest companies still alive, the big dinosaur, uh, IBM, is intelligent business machines. That's, that's the name of the, of the company. And, and the name was, was there like in the 50s, right? Um, but uh, there is a revolution that we cannot deny and it's there and it's going to change a lot of things. And, and, and I think it's important to understand how uh, large language models, transformers, and, and, and a set of new technologies uh, work, at least uh, superficially. This is impossible that I can give a lecture on, on the internal workings. I'm not the most appropriate person to talk about mathematics, but uh, the functioning of, of, of GPT, ChatGPT, and, and other instances um, of, uh, yeah, of transformers or large language models, basically, most of you might already be familiar, but we prompt it, we provide some initial text. Uh, this third is converted into tokens, which are small units, like syllables, uh, which are then turned into numbers, and then we enter an embedded multidimensional space of uh, uh, where th terms that are 
together, usually used together, become associated. Like, I don't know, uh, Palestinian and terrorists. Uh, this is ironic, by the way, just in case. Uh, or uh, any, any other combination, right? And, uh, and this is uh, crystallized into this huge uh, embedding space. That's how it's called. Um, and then there are a number of uh, layers of neural network that process all this embedded uh, information to try to predict, this is what is the generative asp uh, aspect of the model, to try to predict what will be the next uh, token in, the, in this chain. So for example, if I say, uh, hi, hello, what is the most uh, statistically uh, probable follow up to this start of a conversation. Hello, how are you? Right? I'm good, whatever. This, this is typical conversation and, the, and this uh, vast neural network will try to uh, predict that. And then we, we turn to, to point one. I mean, that's, that's how it works in cycles. Uh, even if we are not interacting with it, every, whenever an artificial neural network of this kind produces an output, it feeds back to itself and is somehow eating its own uh, output all the time. Uh, the training is perhaps more important and it will become very important in a minute. Bear with me. First is the corpus. All these monsters in terms of the size uh, of these uh, digital brains, if you want to call them that way, uh, are fed with a corpus of almost all the humanly produced uh, and digitalized uh, information. Obviously, Wikipedia, every text, every forum, every content that has ever been digitalized is the, uh, the, the food the, 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 uh, that uh, these uh, systems are fed with. And, and they train and they learn from, from human-generated uh, text. Then all this is tokenized, and, and there is a, ho a lot of human labor here as well. And, and this is a, a very uh, uh, interesting irony that uh, the revolution we are witnessing today owes a lot to, to, to these mechanisms of attention that were uh, introduced into artificial intelligence in 2019, so very recently. Attention is all you need. This is a very famous uh, paper. And, and here is the, the irony or the paradox that in the uh, attention economy, in the economy where we are becoming poorer and poorer <laughs> in attention because it's sucked by, by, by digital capitalism. Uh, artificial in intelligence is becoming stronger because it's discovered a way to manage attention, right? So we, we, our attention is destroyed and the attention of the artificial intelligence gods is increasing. Uh, and this is a, a, a uh, well, a beautiful <laughs> uh, paradox, uh, intellectually, and a terrible one in the human uh, suffering of it. And we all suffer of attention deficit. Um, and this will grow bigger as the attention of the machines it becomes stronger. Then we have the, the generator, right? The generator, there's a beautiful song by, by Bad Religion, by the way. I'm the generator, it's just fantastic. You, maybe you can listen to it and think on the generator of uh, ChatGPT. It's a, it's, it's, it's a huge system, 10 to the power of 14 parameters, and this is growing exponentially, it's, it's so crazy. Uh, this is a lot. I mean, nobody understands the generator. This is important to, to, to be clear. Nobody understands how this machine works, not even its creators. And, uh, and, and there is an issue of a scale. When you make uh, massive computing devices like this, at some point, new things happen. Uh, uh, emerge, new capacities emerge. And that, that, that was a new discovery. They were the neural network that I programmed uh, 20 ye years ago. I look like a, a very old man. When I was 22, <laughs> uh, it had like 12 neurons or something, right? Now they have 10 to the power of 14. It's just a tremendous amount of, of parameters. Uh, and this is the generator that's capable of predicting the new tokens, right? And then this is very becoming even more important than the generator. is how human reinforcement learning. Humans train the, the monster so it doesn't do bad things and improves. Like, like you have a dragon, huh? and you, if you've seen uh, Game of Thrones, you have to train it not, not to eat your friends and shit. And so some, something like this happens here. There's a lot of human labor there too. Okay. 
So this is so far the new generation of artificial intelligence. This is going to be updated. We don't know anymore how the new generations. Th this is the all these uh, chat GPT diagrams were built for uh, uh, GPT 3.5. We, do, we know nothing about GPT-4, we, we know nothing about Gemini, or the, the new types of artificial intelligences that big corporations are creating are absolutely black boxed, and we have no idea. Not only we don't understand how they work because they have so many parameters, we don't even know what kind of architectures they are implementing, we don't know how many parameters they have. Now it's, it's just very obscured at the corporate level. Okay, um, so, but as I said, uh, all human intelligence is artificial. I mean, we, we, Silex innovation uh, was, was a driver of the cortex evolution. There, there are some very interesting researchers uh, explaining how what made humans different from other animals was tool use, tool use, uh, hands being free, the, 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 the capacity to vocalize language emerged as a, as a, as a side effect or perhaps as a feedback uh, um, interaction with tool making uh, and with language, a whole new universe of possibilities uh, uh, was possible for, for intelligence on, on Earth. Writing was amazing. Writing, writing was a revolution almost like artificial intelligence or computer science in general uh, today. And, and, and I will explain a little bit. And, and the etymology itself of intelligence is very interesting. Intelligence from, comes from Latin interlegere, which means to, to read among, to read between people, maybe between texts, to be inhabiting their textual world. So intelligence and writing are very important, and this, this is going to be important uh, now. So there are five, four ways and a, and a bonus manner in which uh, artificial intelligence of the type they are selling to us is, is a form of collective intelligence. The first one we should never forget is the mathematics behind it. The mathematics behind uh, ChatGPT and the incoming uh, gods is uh, uh, an amazing result of human research, open source research, as science, good science is usually, uh, should be, and is, in general. And, uh, and this is important. It's not a mathematical invention of open AI that, in fact, <laughs> one of the problems and the, and the reason why big corporations are closing all the research on artificial intelligence is that they were coping from each other so much and so productively that now they realize that they don't want to open source their, their, their uh, research. But the mathematics behind it, 99% of the mathematics behind any artificial intelligence, is a, is a human legacy of uh, mathematicians and, 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 and their families supporting and feeding the mathematician, <laughs> obviously, and all this, right? Then there's the corpus on which it's trained. is ho the whole human uh, library of human creations, right? And this is very important to, to, to consider because uh, it's not that it could have been an, a small artificial intelligence, you know, that Sam Altman or Elon Musk has created and, and, and learned from the master. And, you know, well, maybe in that case, it's more, less collective and more of an Elon Musk uh, creature, if you want. But that's not the case. These creatures are fed on all of us, all our uh, contributions to different forums, all our writings, the those of our ancestors. But they are also the product of very cheap outsourced human labor. Uh, on the embeddings, on the data set cleaning, all the invisible work that is behind uh, the, the artificial intelligence is amazing. We're talking about hundreds and thousands of workers, low paid. I discovered through doing some research about artificial intelligence, I discovered this Amazon human torque. You know about that? It's just a, uh, Amazon, everybody knows, as a, as a, as a, as a buyer of products. Uh, but then there is a production side of Amazon, and so it's, it's, it's very much a proxy of, of human digital labor. So you, you have some problem, you have to classify data, uh, you don't have sufficient students to, uh, to enslave, uh, you don't have uh, whatever, you, you can outsource that. And uh, Amazon will be a very nice intermediary between you and, and a lot of poor people in China, Pakistan, India, wherever, that will work for uh, less than a dollar per hour of very tedious uh, intellectual work for you to accomplish your task. Uh, funny is, <laughs> so more than one artificial intelligence company was discovered to have 
humans working behind it, <laughs> but uh, and not an artificial intelligence. But almost all artificial intelligence that doesn't involve human intervention on the execution of the artificial intelligence had a lot of uh, low-paid human labor on the production of the data set or the or, or, or many other forms of training of, 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 the, of, the, of, the, of the machine. Then there is uh, reinforcement learning by human feedback. This is very important. I mentioned before how you have to train the dragon and you have to, uh, but this is very important. And last but not least is, is that <laughs> artificial intelligence has surprise. They consume a lot of energy, water, minerals, and infrastructures that need human care cons continuously. And this is very important because now that we will make artificial intelligence as gods, we think they live in the Olympus and <laughs> in the cloud, and, and, and they are very earthly creatures. Okay, so the new gods. So, so we, we have created gods. Uh, and, and let me just take a, a few sentences and ideas from old philosophers. Feuerbach said that man first unconsciously and involuntarily created gods in his own image. This will become important later, I'll show you. And after this, uh, God consciously and voluntarily created man in his own image. Huh? This is important. Uh, and, and it happens all, all the power and domination structures are of this kind. So we first created God as a white man, <laughs> and then, you know, only white men uh, were capable of uh, doing many priest things, like giving talks uh, here. Uh, then you have uh, Durkheim, for example. He was a very interesting sociologist of religion. And he thought, and this is important thought, Religion and gods are not superstitious, stupid ideas that, you know, primitive things. They, are, they embody human knowledge, right? Uh, maybe you don't have to believe that God exists as an entity, but it, you have to acknowledge that God condenses, symbolizes human knowledge, norms, uh, and ways of being. And it's something that uh, deserves a study and careful analysis. Okay, so we've done something similar with artificial intelligence. We're about to do this. Like the gods, artificial intelligence lives in the cloud. Uh, they promise immortality. They promise immortality. Uh, uh, absolute wisdom, you know. Um, uh, what was this uh, Greek oracle? Um, oh, Delphos, yeah? Yeah, Delphi oracle. So the new gods uh, fulfill the same function uh, that the old gods did. They organize our life, they tell us what to do, you know. It's pretty much what gods did. Uh, but all civilizations uh, were very aware that they had to align. They had to, the, the early civilizations, those that grew up in, in the early cities with pyramids and jerarchical power structures, they very rapidly became aware that uh, they needed religion uh, to align, to align human interests and the interest of power. And they invented this idea of the king uh, god, right? It's typical of uh, Babylonic religions, of Mayan, Aztec, and uh, Egyptian uh, civilizations. Uh, and we are doing uh, a little bit of what uh, Feuerbach was saying. Uh, human made gods, uh, we made gods, uh, these artificial intelligent gods at our image uh, because they are feeding on human data. Not all human data, obviously. Uh, there are many people that are excluded of creating, contributing with their data, with their creations to the uh, corpus that, uh, from which the artificial intelligence learns. Uh, uh, but in, in a way, artificial intelligence is nothing than that, well, our, our own knowledge. And on the other hand, and this is perhaps more important, uh, oh, sorry, I had other slides, yes. Uh, this one we always used in the, uh, in the CDN, uh, which are now, you, you, you didn't use this one this, this year. But look, the big, uh, as I said, the, the early civilizations took gods that existed and merged it with the political system to align humans uh, with, the, with political power. And the same happened with the big corporations. These are the corporations that became the big civilization, so to speak, in the stock market in the, early, in the, in the, in the last years, the big tech corporations taking over previous uh, big corporations. Um, and this is uh, the investment of the, the, the biggest corporations on artificial intelligence. So big corporations are buying artificial intelligence almost like all civilizations were buying 
buying, acquiring uh, religious gods to solve the alignment problem on the other side of the alignment problem. I'll talk about that. Anyway, um, so uh, be aware that the gods will make humans at their image as well. And this is part of the problem of artificial intelligence today, is that it will probably blur some differences uh, and uh, discriminate more people because it is those artificial intelligence are going to talk and drive and direct us in manners that are typical of the training data. And perhaps even more uh, worryingly, now that uh, a lot of artificial intelligence is trained by other artificial intelligences. So there is a, so some kind of artificial intelligence cannibalism going on. And this is going to degenerate, like all religions do at some point. Uh, and what, what is terrible is that they, they, will, they will force us also to perhaps cannibalize each other and, uh, and, and degrade our creativity. But maybe we can also put them at good use. So the, the gods are, were dead, uh, but artificial intelligence is not alive. Let, let me explain this a little bit. Well, I'm a philosopher, and philosophers made a, a nice business explaining why God is dead, and you have here Nietzsche, uh, which was the bigger opener of this line of uh, marketing in philosophy, very, very fruitful, very, very exciting. Uh, our job now, I think, is to uh, remind you that artificial intelligence is not alive. Huh? Uh, so here, here is a machine that runs artificial intelligence, a chip. Here is the machine that makes the machine, right? Uh, which is super complex. And here is the machine that makes the machine that makes the machine. And, and the machine that makes the machine that makes the machine that makes the machine is the whole planet, all of us, because we're making possible for these factories and technology to grow up. Uh, and here is a machine that makes a machine that makes a machine that makes a machine. It's a bacteria. So the, one of the great differences between life and artificial intelligence and technology is that life is capable of caring for itself of producing and reproducing itself something that artificial intelligence is not capable of doing. And this is very important. This is what I'm saying. Artificial intelligence is not alive. It needs us, humans. The same happened with the gods. When Nietzsche said that God is dead, it, was, it wasn't a death certificate. <laughs> the, you know? It's what, hey, people, this thing, God, is dead. We invented it, right? And now I'm going to kill it because, you know, all philosophers need a big marketing kind of... Uh, punchline, and, and he invented this one, but behind this punchline is the idea that gods are creations of humans, th so is morals, and you can do a genealogy of morals, and you can discover why we orient our behavior in terms of religious beliefs, etc., that we can deconstruct if you want, uh, and redesign and become freer as a society. Okay, so these tiny machines are bacteria, I love bacteria, and it was actually super hard to, to find a photo of a single bacteria. Because they reproduce, they are okay. collectively reproduce, right? And they live collectively, unlike uh, Elon Musk, sorry, artificial intelligence. Um, so, and they live collectively in a planet, I in Gaia. We live in a planet, uh, and there is no planet B, right? So this is very important to take the whole picture of, of artificial intelligence. Um, so the new gods, artificial intelligence, are not alive, but they are very undead. So, they're not dead either, right? Uh, so, this is a very complicated ontology of zombies and, and we, you know, because, you know, they're not alive, they're not biological systems, but they're not dead. And, uh, and as you know, this is the type of system that is very powerful and dangerous, right? Uh, when you're not alive, but you're, you aren't dead either. Uh, so, this is important. Okay. So how can we be democratic in times of gods? How can, what can, you, can we learn from those societies that suddenly came to be dominated by specific types of religious alignment with uh, political power, hierarchy, and a degradation of, uh, of democracy? So the first inspiration here are animists. Animists are the, uh, generally the type of religion or magical thinking or, well, or just philosophy of life and social organizing of pre-civilization, uh, original societies, indigenous people. And for their worldview, everything is full of small spirits, 
right? Mini gods. There is no big god. It's just the spirit of something and something else. Uh, and they do little jobs, right? Uh, and this is something we can, we can learn from. Maybe we can go for small artificial intelligence assistance uh, or perhaps just do without artificial intelligence, without gods, right? Uh, these are simple programs, scripts, uh, small demons on the computer. So computer programs are, sp are like spirits. You tell them to do something. It's like black magic and things, right? You, you, do, uh, uh, you, you, you write the code. Uh, this is why magic is so important that you, you, the spell is perfect, right? It's usually in a, in a weird language, usually Latin. If you've seen uh, Harry Potter, you have to spell perfectly. And the same happens with the scripts and computer programs, right? You have to write the, 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 the nice code. And if you make a, a mistake, it doesn't work. It's the same. These are the old programs. No artificial intelligence, no supercomputer computing everything for me. Uh, I just run it in my computer, and, and everything is OK. So this is one possibility to, to do without big artificial intelligence. Next the possibility, to dissociate religion from uh, political power. And this is an innovation that uh, we owe to uh, uh, pre-Columbian uh, Mesoamerican societies. And Teotihuacan is a beautiful example. Uh, Teotihuacan is a mystery. Nobody exactly knows. Uh, but uh, it's open to interpretation. And some of these interpretations are super cool. Uh, they had this uh, amazing temple of the feeder serpent. That feeder serpent uh, was a, a kind of a unified, uh, I'm going to say it this way, it was a fascist god, right? I mean, yes, because it was like centralizing power and, and domination and everything. And people in Teotihuacan, they got, just burned the temple, right? And they municipalized it. So they built on top of it another one. And then some, some friends of mine are doing some very interesting research on how there is a kind of fractalization of religion and, and, and how some structures of the, of the religious temples are reproduced at different scales within the city, in neighborhoods, and then inside some kind of collective building that they had where they, about 100 or 200 people were living together in some kind of uh, a municipal housing uh, program. Uh, and, and interestingly, also, Teotihuacan was uh, almost like an anarchist uh, Silicon Valley because they were, they were producing, uh, yeah, a, a stone technology and exporting it. And, and they were doing it in this democratic and, and cosmopolitan manner that's really amazing. And, and the way they broke with uh, one religion and fractalized it and had a small... Uh, gods uh, uh, distributed over the city is something beautiful to explore. And so if you're interested, I can give you some literature on this. It's, it's very interesting. Here, uh, this is very important. When people in, the, in, in Mesoamerican societies were doing religious rituals, and it's all about artificial intelligence as well, mathematics, knowledge, uh, calendars, organization of, 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 of life, it's all merged into very sophisticated mathematical tools. So we're not taking, this is not about uh, rituals, uh, superstitious, uh, stupid things. So when I say gods at the time and religious rituals, it was a very sophisticated and innovative technological uh, device uh, that was in place when they do it. So, okay, more inspiration. Uh, that was Teotihuacan. Uh, the polytheism in Athens, right? Uh, so Athens was, was really great. In the General Assembly, that was meeting more than once per month, uh, where everybody was welcome, uh, the Phoenix, which is the area where the uh, Assembly okay, was taking place, could host uh, 15,000 people. So I think the CD hasn't been used in one single assembly or, or offline with 15,000 people yet. And the guys, so one of the things that, uh, for which the assembly meeting was required was, for example, are we going to go to war? Yes or no? Or do this we have to decide between all of us? But one more decision that has to be collective, are we accepting a new god in the city? Yes or no? That was a collective decision. Anyway, so democratically selected which kind of artificial intelligences are socially uh, acceptable, and public funding for artificial intelligence, and public ownership of artificial intelligence. This is uh, innovations that we can learn from Athens. And finally, anabaptism, that was a big uh, revolution in the early years of uh, uh, yeah, the printing press and the revolution 
uh, in religion that, that came uh, with it. And uh, this is open source in religion because with the printing press, the Bible could be printed and everybody had access to it. And we can learn about, about, about those open source community managed religions uh, groups that were decapitated, most of them, unfortunately. Okay, so, uh, okay. All this is possible and there is a huge ecosystem of artificial intelligences out of the big corporations and, uh, and it's impossible to, to, sum, to summarize it here, but be aware that uh, we have a very rich uh, religious tree of uh, uh, polytheist uh, artificial intelligences. And, and now I'm going to go very quickly into two slides about uh, Decidim and artificial intelligence. So, one uh, possibility is to use artificial intelligence as an assistant, right? Because one of the ama most amazing things in which artificial intelligence has been democratized is that we can just talk to it and ask artificial intelligence to do things, and they do it uh, quite well, better than us very often, including translations, but uh, not always. Uh, so it could be an assistant in programming, so probably this is going to, if not already, have an impact in, in the in the CDIM development. May, maybe it can democratize programming for the CDIM, and you don't have to know a lot about Ruby on Rails in order to make changes in the CDIM. Uh, but assistants could also assist, assist on configuring participatory spaces or processes. Uh, the CDIM has a difficult barrier for people that install it and want to uh, configure it, and it could just easily help us. It could also facilitate uh, participatory processes be an agent that is there helping people agree on so subjects, making summaries of debates that's been, that are taking place, connecting people, hey, do you know this guy? Thinks like you, or maybe just thinks of the opposite, you should talk, whatever. Uh, and it could also assist on writing proposals, maybe checking whether the proposal you are about to make has a legal uh, pos possibility or not, etc. The most challenging, perhaps, is to think of artificial intelligence as an interface, because Technology and computer interfaces are about to suffer the biggest change in 50 years. Uh, and this change is from clicking a button, uh, which is action-directed interface, where I tell the computer what to do by clicking a button, by writing a program, by uh, uh, pressing an a, a enter button, uh, to interacting with computers by intention. And I tell, as I tell many artificial intelligence, uh, mid-journey, whatever, I want a picture of like this. This is very different from using Paint or GIMP, right? I tell the computer the kind of image I want, and the computer generates it. Uh, and so if the CDIM as ever, will ever transit to this kind of interface, and these changes are coming, we have to think about it now, because it's going to be important. Because maybe people will not enter decidim.org or something and make a proposal. It will just talk and say, hey, I want to make a proposal for my city, you know? And this will be the interface with the CDIM. And I'm, I'm finishing with these two. Uh, the CDIM, uh, so artificial intelligence has participatory automata. Uh, this has already been talked about, and there are big risks. Uh, many uh, the CDIM instances are flawed with bots, and this is going to become a never uh, bigger problem. But there are also opportunities here. Maybe we can delegate. I don't, I'm not very fan of the opportunities, to be honest, but they are there, and we should discuss about them. Maybe we can represent non-humans with bots. Yeah, maybe animals, maybe ecosystems, maybe, I don't know, some art or ancient people that is already dead can intervene. Who knows? Uh, and finally, is artificial intelligence an alignment problem? So artificial intelligence, the system is already being used to regulate artificial intelligence. This is great. But maybe we can also steer uh, artificial intelligence uh, and uh, well, there is, a, there, is a, there is a huge literature on, on, on how super artificial superintelligence could, you know, uh, become a monster and we have to steer it and, and maybe the CDIM can be a, a nice interface between human collective and political direction giving and artificial intelligence to, to train it, to direct it, to steer it. And uh, beyond artificial intelligence, there is artificial life. I have no time to talk about this, but thank, 
uh, to Robert, we, you are going to see the potential of applying other techniques of complex systems to, uh, to democracy. And I just wanted to finish with a big risk that I think is important in all these debates. Uh, of one of them is obviously to take the gods as really existing gods and not just an, as undead, non-living uh, systems. But the big dissociation that is happening and worries me a lot, uh, and dissociation is a psychological uh, problem that is very severe, and it happens when one cannot handle the complexity and the anxiety of life and dissociates uh, the body and the emotions from the mind, right? And this is happening in our societies. Uh, th this is a reality. We are, there is no possibility of democracy if we are bombing each other, uh, if, if, if we are so poor, if we are destroying the planet. There is no democracy left to, to, to talk about. Uh, and on the other hand, if we fantasize about artificial intelligence and technology as a solution to every problem, uh, we may end up really dissociating from, from reality in a way that uh, has perhaps no, no return. Uh, so, please uh, do not overthink artificial intelligence and let's embody collective intelligence together. Thank you very much. Very well, okay, yeah. Thank you. Uh, what Xavi shared today, I think it may not seem super practical, but <laughs> <laughs> but we, I, I personally think we're embarking in uncharted territory and we need, we need this stuff. Like to me, this is a map of how we should navigate a lot of things that we do not know how they are gonna play. Right? We're introducing a new technology in, a, in the complex system that is human society and planet Earth, and we do not know how it's going to play out. So hopefully you will remember what Xavi said today as you, as decision makers and innovators, uh, start implementing uh, AI into what you do. Thank you, Xavi. And for uh, the person who has already done it, uh, please, Robert. Thank you. So, uh, uh, yeah, thank you so much. Really interesting thoughts, you know, and, and really important as well, because, you know, one of the big dangers of AI is sort of blindly going into it and like not, you know, yeah, as exactly being totally dissociated of what's real. So let's not do that. <laughs> so thanks really for having me here. Uh, so I started to come to Barcelona in 2011, uh, uh, meeting people, talking about digital democracy, and then we were a part of an an EU project called Descent with Open University of Catalonia and, and others. Uh, and they were actually, we were hired by the city of Madrid to help them design Consul. Uh, so uh, we worked on that for uh, yeah, 18 months. And, uh, and then obviously Tessetim sort of originally started as a fork of Consul, but obviously then was rewritten and all of that. But I really, I'm, I'm just so proud of you guys, you know, to having kept this community together, you know, doing so great work all around the world. I mean, um, our foundations and our work in terms of non-profit digital uh, innovation, that's not a given approach. There's actually, you know, some governments that are more liking like market-based approaches to digital democracy, uh, which is uh, pretty dangerous, especially when it comes to AI. But uh, so I started, I've been with the computer revolution really f f from the start. I started to program at nine on this computer in 1981. I sold my first piece of software in 1984, where there was a really interesting situation in Iceland. There was a big media strike. So there's no internet, obviously. So news, uh, newspapers, radio, and TV all went silent for a couple of weeks. There was nothing. You went on the radio. This was just static, you know? And the government, uh, actually, I ended up, for some reason, on a BBC microcomputer, writing an app where the government could put in little news items and then it would scroll up in a digital news feed, and they put monitors all around the city. Um, I worked a lot in arts as well. That's been my, sort of part of my life. I started the first Icelandic hip-hop uh, band, for example. Uh, but in '93, I started uh, uh, the first internet company in Iceland, connecting people to the internet, making the first websites. I did the same in Denmark in '95, making like, the first websites for Iceland there and Tuborg, for example. Uh, in 2001, I, I released, I created the Agent Rupee for artist Lynn Hurstman. So Agent Rupee is the, well, it is probably the oldest still running AI chatbot. It was launched in 2001, and it's a part of the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art permanent uh, exhibition. So let's hope that 
it will, it will stay on uh, for a while yet. Um, I worked a lot in the video game industry, uh, creating the first 3D games on mobile phones. And in uh, 2005, uh, I developed the first mobile version of the Sims game. And Sims game uses a, a type of an artificial intelligence, uh, a bit sort of an A-Life type, very simple at the time. But then, uh, 19th of October 2008, exactly 15 years to today, uh, I was in London. I actually spent 17, uh, 17 years away from Iceland. I was in London, and uh, there was a revolution in Iceland, the Pots and Pans Revolution, where basically citizens, in following the financial crisis, were yeah, completely had lost trust in the government. Where Icelandic Parliament was founded in the year 930, so we had like over 1,000 years of pretty good trust in the Parliament. There, over a period of 10 days, when all the Icelandic banks went bankrupt, all the trust was gone in society. Uh, and so I was in Iceland, not no, in, in London, not able to protest, so uh, me and some friends came together, like from our, some friends from our early internet days, something like, oh, should we try to use the internet to improve decision making for governments, you know? And, uh, and we started to look at, okay, so what is going on with the internet and governments? Well, it turned out in 2008, not much. And, uh, and even we're looking at this in general, it seems that governments, a part of the problem of the financial crisis is that governments are, were falling way behind the complexities of the business world and unable to understand uh, what's going on. And I'm, I'm, I'm a bit fearful exactly today with AI that governments uh, need to be able to, the citizens need to be able to catch up. Uh, and uh, uh, basically we are a, a small non-profit, we're, we're in Iceland, the Citizens Foundation Iceland, but we're also since 2019 Citizens Foundation America, with a 501c, like a non-profit uh, there. And uh, our laptops have been used in uh, thousands of projects uh, in 45 countries. Key partners include, include 20 municipalities in, in Iceland, uh, Scottish Parliament, World Banks, many others. And we have a whole range of sort of different uh, open source solutions uh, um, that, that most use some degree of AI. But I'm going to focus on basically your priorities, how we use the AI there, and also um, a, a new uh, exciting system called Policy Synth. And uh, so your priorities is a sort of a web-based platform in, in a similar way as, you know, Desitim for adding ideas, uh, for having a debate and, uh, um, and uh, you know, so different projects. Uh, this, is an, uh, this is a second attempt to crowdsource the Icelandic constitution. I remember in 2011 when I came here to speak, when I mentioned like the constitution, like the whole room erupted in applause, like, I mean, people were so... You know, but then, I sadly, then actually, those changes never really made it the whole the way. I felt a little bit sad about that, you know. But, but this was a second attempt that hasn't gone anywhere yet. And uh, uh, one of the things that we realized quite early is that, um, you know, when we launched our first pro sort of test project in 2009 called uh, Seattle Parliament, we got a small grant from the Icelandic Parliament, like 10,000 euros, and we set up a Seattle Parliament was taking laws from the Icelandic parliament and uh, giving people the opportunity to comment on them, have a discussion about them. And me and Gunnar, my, my, my main co-founder, we launched this and then in the first evening we had this uh, laws about fisheries policies and just in a few hours we had this horrible personal argument on the site. And people were not talking about fish anymore, they were, talking just, they were just throwing things at each other sort of, you know, in a verbal way. So we thought like, great. Great innovation. We have created one more place on the internet for people to argue, you know. And, uh, but uh, obviously, that was quite sort of ironic. So we spent quite a bit of time. Uh, and then when we launched uh, our Better Reykjavik project, the city of Reykjavik in 2010, we, we have come up with this sort of deliberation system which is sort of gamified in a way where we're not asking people to uh, come up with, uh, um, or tell us what, 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 what they think about something. We're actually putting them to work. Here's an idea, your job is to find the best pros and cons for this idea. And actually it works really well in terms of people are not, uh, uh, yeah, here's an example of it about ownership of resources, where people tend to argue about. There was a lot of argument on Facebook about this. We used Facebook to advertise it. And people were throwing things at each other on, on Facebook, like crazy, on the same issue. But on the platform, they just behaved really nicely, just points for, points against. And also the main sort of, uh, 
reason also for this is that when you have put a point for or against, all the people can't comment on it. So it doesn't create those threats of you know, discussion. Um, but on AI, uh, then, you know, it's been an evolution for us. I, I, my background is I've been working with AI in different forms, you know, basically my whole career in, in video games and other contexts. And, uh, and then in 2010, you know, we had this big volcano eruption in Iceland uh, called Eyjafjallajökull. And it sort of, you know, disturbed, you know, air travel all, all across Europe. So this led to an, a, a, a crazy tourism boom in Iceland. It was really like, and, and we needed a lot of people to come to work in the tourism industry. So in 2014, we had about 15,000 people living in Reykjavik that spoke no Icelandic, right? And there, there was about, there's about 10, 15% of the population. So the, the local government, we were thinking about this with them, and they were thinking, oh, maybe we should put up an English website also, a better Reykjavik, a Polish one, a Lithuanian, a Taiwan, whatever. But we thought, oh, well, we have Google Translate. It's not perfect, <laughs> you know, but... And we sort of convinced them of using Google Translate instead. So, <coughs> so instead of putting many websites in many different languages, everybody could be, be together. And I mean, and it, it was a stretch of the imagination a bit in 2014, because like, you know, almost every translation you put through, like from English to Icelandic, you could have a laugh about it, you know. It was like, it was like, it was always something funny about it that was sort of wrong. But it worked. People could get the gist of it. If you were a Polish, uh, people working in the, in the tourism, and, and, the, and the thing is like, there were so many families coming to Iceland where the children were going to school, you know, and the government and us, we want people to be a, a, you, know, a you know, productive, me you know, like members of the democratic society as well. But I mean, Icelandic is difficult to learn and you can't expect like grown people just to, you know, go straight into talking fluid Icelandic just because they moved to Iceland a few months earlier. And, uh, and then, sort of over the years, we have uh, been, you know, we basically have this test. Does the AI empower citizens democratically? It's like, do we have a use for it? You know, we're not going to add any AI features just because it's like, it's cool or anything, you know? And that goes, for example, with speech to text. Uh, this originally, you know, we dealt for, um, you know, disabled people, so people can speak in the right ears, you know. But this actually helped also in terms of accessibility, and you mentioned that, <laughs> that before, in terms of like, and especially boys, our boys in, in Iceland and many other countries are like a like huge reading gap. They have a harder time typing in ideas, but easier time just speaking them in. And, uh, and, uh, and even if the debating system is uh, uh, really good at uh, filtering out toxicity in this context, uh, then we also have since like 2016 had like an automated AI that monitors everything that goes into uh, our platforms uh, to, sort of to fill, fulfill our zero tolerance to toxicity policy. So if there is any toxicity detected, then us and the, the owner of the product that's running on your priorities get an email, and, uh, but they always have the, uh, we, had, we don't have the AI automatically hiding anything or, or things like that. And then we you know, done quite a bit of uh, sort of natural language processing analytics, like 2018-19 when we started to get those embedding uh, like, uh, like we were talking about earlier, about the changing text into tokens and embeddings, you know, we started to be able to do things like uh, automatically clustering together similar ideas. And when you have projects, uh, like with 1,000 to 2,000, 3,000 ideas, it's actually, you know, nice to be able to understand them through sort of clustering and, and sort of other, other sort of methods. And, uh, but now, uh, since, uh, since uh, just... Uh, yeah, basically in March, basically the, you know, just a day after GPT-4 came out, we launched the chatbot uh, for your priorities. I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, uh, but basically, here's a sample from, from Oakland. Uh, uh, and actually, let me not show you the example from Oakland. Let me just show you a live demo here, if that works. And uh, so basically, this is in my neighborhood, a participatory budgeting project in Reykjavik, sort of the last cycle, where we had a record number of 1,700 ideas. And that's a lot for a small uh, 100,000 people city like, I mean, like, uh, like Reykjavik. I mean, Reykjavik is basically 10 times smaller than, than Barcelona, you know, so, uh, and, uh, uh, and so that's a lot of ideas, and you can choose, you know, you know, the neighborhood, and you can go through them, and you can search through them, and that's very nice, you know. But 
it's gonna and you know we have like this sort of recommendation AI so if you're using it on your on your mobile you can sort of swipe through the ideas but 1700 ideas is a lot of swiping you know and uh, so uh, uh, so what we did is that we have this GPT-4 AI assistant for any of your priorities project and it's basically using a technology called retrieval augmented generation so it's using like ChatGPT or GPT-4 with brain but when we ask a question so for example um, let's see tell me what ideas uh, con the to technology uh, but like a tech like that so first thing it does is that it searches our database of for what I asked for and then it brings that in information uh, to uh, uh, you know basically chat to so uh, then uh, you know we are sort of obviously GPT-4 or just AI models know nothing about a participatory budgeting I mean they, they know about the regular I can give GPT-4 that but they <coughs> in general don't, don't know anything about those projects you know so uh, uh, so in this case you can ask about uh, ask ask a question like this so sure here are some ideas related to the technology and then it's like a hybrid interface where you have like an, an uh, uh, you know you can access the ideas directly from uh, uh, from the chatbot and uh, and the debate obviously as well and you can ask so what is the uh, the purpose of the tech work so we have like automatically generated sort of follow-ups this is, this is sort of so to keep the you know conversation going so uh, and uh, and one thing I uh, said like a counterpoint you know I want to make here is that one of the features we added to our chatbot was the the we tested it was like a way you say like you are doing PP and say like create an idea for me uh, for, for like a dog park and like with nice images and then like we have a GPT-4 chat GPT does that like that and they're like really good idea I mean even I mean like, you know it's not bad you know the output of it but when we started to test it and we had some external people started to test it we just realized it was wrong you know we don't want to have our AI assistants at least at not at this point knowing so little about us personally knowing little about the environments we live in we don't want them to start to write our ideas you know because then we can just end up in a world in a where you know you know we have a, a, a loads of blunt AI ideas you know you know running around so we basically we just deleted it well we, it's not we, yeah so we uh, but for uh, you know going through a lot of data and uh, sort of having question answering about the projects for example I can say here uh, what are the rules so and then you know the chatbot will know everything about the rules of the my neighborhood you know project for example you know and so it's super you know useful but uh, also there is a, a I mean we thought like oh you know I mean it would be interesting to have this you know functionality where it could automatically generate ideas and but this is a danger but this is like humans often choose the easy way even if there's something that's a lot better that a, lot, a little bit harder you know often we are humans often choose the easy way for good reasons you know obviously but uh, uh, let me go back here to the presentation like that so uh, uh, yeah I'm just gonna go like uh, this a little, little slideshow just for 30 seconds so so we've been uh, uh, working in the city of Reykjavik for yeah no 13 years and uh, a lot of different projects the PP project is obviously sort of one of the sort of base projects but also two minutes all right so uh, okay so I, I'm gonna skip that whole part here okay so um, so anyway this uh, I'm, I'm happy to share the presentation if you wanna uh, yeah I thought I had a little bit more time than that <laughs> sorry about that so uh, um, yeah, so uh, yeah, so one, uh, you know, because I was here speaking at uh, Desert Dim Fest in 2016 uh, when we showed the first sort of 3D experiments with your priorities that we're doing. This is a project from this year we're doing with the national government of Iceland uh, uh, and three of the largest by area, like municipalities in in in, in Iceland, and uh, uh, was basically it's called the land use game and it's built with your priorities SDK. And where uh, we are asking people to come in and to 
to choose what would be the right ideal land use for an area, and then they have a debate about it, and this is sort of the, uh, the, the results view that you see there. But last for just a couple of you know, more minutes, uh, so uh, our new project, PolicySynth, so uh, it is sort of an extension of our work with AI in general in your priorities, and, uh, uh, and we have a pretty good, I have a pretty good sense of what those models are good at, you know, and what they're not good at. Um, I think when people try those models for the first time, they tend to be over enthusiastic about how good they are, you know, then when you start to try it more, you start to realize the limitations. But, you know, currently the, uh, the, uh, 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 the you know, best use that, that we have seen is, is doing automated large-scale web research. So basically, like calling Google or Bing from the server, from the AI, you know, well, actually creating search queries, uh, calling, uh, uh, you know, Google or Bing, uh, getting a lot of search results back, using basically like a browser in the back end, the system called Puppeteer, for example, to then just go to those websites and then scan the data and look for what we're looking for. So this is something that obviously you could have a team of 100 researchers two or 50, you know, but it's like something that is, is, is both expensive, impractical for most cases, but this is something that AI yeah, does really, really well. Like, and if you take like a 100 page PDF uh, document about something, and you have GPT-4 go through every single page to, to get some data out, I would challenge most humans to do that as effectively, you know, and uh, I sometimes wonder with those PDFs, like just how many humans actually read those. It, sorting and categorizing large amount of information, that's like, a, like something that is really, uh, uh, you know, a, a big skill over the past like 10, like 20 years even, in terms of what AI can be good at, classifying things, that's sort of the backbone of things. And now also, and what we have discovered with policy synth, is that when we have an idea that are human uh, sourced, um, human debated, we are using this evolutionary algorithm or a genetic algorithm to have uh, the AI take those uh, ideas and evolve them, combine them, recombine them, mutate them, and so on. And those models are really good at that. The key risk that we see is reduced human agency. And that's like the example of uh, before, where we had, uh, uh, yeah, basically, you know, we decided not to release this feature of create your, like have the AI create an idea because it would take the agency away from people. And this is happening, this can happen in so many different places, you know, in the whole pipeline of AI work. Over summarization, I heard I was in a, in a panel, uh, uh, yeah, just a couple of months ago, like with one, like a commercial, like a for-profit democracy company, and they were sort of saying, oh, we have this AI that's gonna take thousands of your ideas well, actually, no, they said we had a project with a city where they had 1,000 ideas, and we had our AI summarize it into five ideas. I was like, no, that's so wrong. You know, the AI is not good enough to do that, and that's so, like, for the city, it's like, oh, it's like, oh, we don't need to sort any ideas. We just, the AI did all the work for us. You know, that's, that's really bad. But, and, and in general, it's easy to sort of, uh, you know, uh, 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 sort of, you know, cut humans out of the loop. And sorry, I know we're all, almost out of time. Oh, well, um, uh, I'm just gonna show you one more thing here. So, so this is the GitHub page for Policy Synth, and uh, I made a, a slightly amended one here, um, just to sort of uh, uh, explain uh, how uh, Policy Synth works. So basically, in the middle, there's a lot of very simple AI agents that do very simple tasks, you know, and then, on the left and the right side, you have any citizen engagement tool, you can use your priorities, I and mean, that's what we're using now, obviously, that's our tool, but there's no direct dependency on policy synth on your priorities, so you could use DSM or console or whatever else. But uh, on the left side, you have expert alignment and input, so those are like policy experts, and then you have, on the right side, you have inputs from citizens, and the thing is that uh, this is, uh, and then we have this whole process of doing different things and ranking things, evolutionary algorithms, coming off the policies and, and so on. And, uh, uh, but the whole process is like there's human alignment at every single stage, you know? 
and, and we never ask in this process, you know, ChatGPT, create an idea for this problem for me. We either source it through searching the web or from human crowdsourcing with human ideas, you know? I mean, and that's just because of not that, I mean, I mean, maybe GPT-4 will be so smart at one point, they will just know everything. But it, it is just like a, comp it has a very compressed, compressed version of reality, what we know from our texts. So it's, even though it can come up with a couple of good ideas sometimes, I mean, humans are just better at coming up with good ideas. You know, as I'm, I'm you know, sure, I mean, I know you know in, the, in this community, you know, that just how creative people can be. And just a final uh, version of this, there's also like a web interface. You can see some of our research there in terms of how policy synth works, in terms of how the web research works, how we have AI, uh, well, how we have the uh, solutions found online uh, being uh, evolved, uh, you know, using those uh, evolutionary algorithms where it's uh, taking human sourced ideas, uh, testing, recombining them, and then, uh, yeah. And, uh, yeah, so, and, just, and we actually have one a really uh, exciting project uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, Northeastern University uh, in, in, in Boston, and uh, where students are using policy synth to help uh, the Museum of Science in Boston to come up with policy recommendations on how to close the reading gap in the US. So, so stay tuned for more information about that, but thanks. Hola, hola. Okay, so thanks a lot, Robert. That was very, very smart. I like that even like the earlier uh, things you did have a very high sensibility on the human aspect, like the human behavior of participation. And, you know, that's very interesting because uh, we, with all this hi hype on, on AI, people are too focused on, uh, on the technology itself. Yep and not in a smart way of using the technology. So I failed to introduce myself. My name is Ali Gonzalez. I'm uh, with Codeando Mexico and also the, the CDIM Association. Uh, my job is actually helping governments introduce technology to solve issues. And often they have very wrong expectations about uh, what can technology do. And that's the case for AI. So we have seen, uh, I think I'm just gonna ask you one question because it's about to end, uh, but we have seen especially the AI uh, obliterating jobs of actual people uh, and those people being, you know, substituted by, uh, by AIs. And that to me is super worrying. So uh, I want to ask you, like, what are the big, like, that's an example, but what are the big no-nos? We should not go towards that when using AI. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Robert has mentioned some of. Uh, I have to apologize because I, I took too much time. That's okay. And uh, and actu actually, I, something that surprises me a lot from ChatGPT is that it knows when to stop. Sometimes it has a token limit, but sometimes you know this is super smart. I mean, I haven't reached that level yet. Um, so uh, no, no. Well, I think you 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 put some good. So artificial intelligence should not be the the, the creator of solutions for a society, right? Uh, maybe it can be an assistant, but it shouldn't substitute human will and human imagination, but by no means, that's for sure. Um, I think also we are too much reliant right now on big corporate artificial intelligence. We have to change that quickly. Uh, I think the opportunities are open there, so I think we, we, we have to establish strong alliances with open source artificial intelligence, although there are also problems there. Uh, some people believe it's too powerful a technology to be open, etc. But we have to intervene in this, and certainly we shouldn't uh, connect the CDIM to a, a, a functioning and, uh, I don't know how to say, uh, powerful uh, corporate-run uh, artificial intelligence. And we should also, I, and this is something I don't really know how to solve, but I think we shouldn't do, is that since artificial in intelligence is bringing with it all the biases, all the bad things about humans together with the good ones, uh, I think we, should, we have to be also very careful. On, on delegating or by other means uh, uh, using artificial intelligence 
because it's 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 human <laughs> after all uh, uh, with with all these problems but it's not alive you know and so in that situation uh, we have to uh, not stop talking to each other as humans whatever we do with artificial intelligence that's the no-no no, don't stop talking to each other yeah to, to me personally the no-no is no delegation mm -hmm. at all like mm -hmm. because it is not organic mm -hmm. and it cannot be accountable mm -hmm. if it makes a mistake yeah. what about you yeah absolutely you know and i actually uh, you know uh, i actually with you know small people here you know we were at an OECD event uh, you know in paris a couple of days ago you know uh, and uh, it was quite interesting but what was uh, you know most sort of concerning there when it comes to ai specifically because ai is such you know you know coming in so fast from so many angles is that the environment of civic tech is sort of decidedly moving towards a for-profit model, yeah. you know, and that is a big no-no for me. But civil society, if civil society and citizens, you know, are not in the loop of helping to do any of this, you know, then I, 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 I'm quite worried because the, because the incentives of governments and big tech, you know, and private companies, you know, they just... I mean, they might have the best interest for everybody at heart, but obviously they want to make money and things like that, which is natural. But it's just like, it's going to be so easy for the machine to take over like that. Yes. <laughs> All right, so hopefully <laughs> that won't happen and you guys will retain the critical uh, mass that we have developed. And to me, that's it. Hopefully this will be helpful as you integrate uh, AI into your developments and your, and your projects. And thanks a lot. Let's, let's thank, thank Xavi and Robert. Thank you. So we're off we go, right? Or what's next? Okay. Is there a space for questions? Yeah, yeah, let's take, take a couple of questions. If you, if we, have, if we have questions, yes, please. Yeah, questions. Yeah, please. Go ahead. Uh, there's a question from Robert. Sure. So, uh, your, uh, your neighborhood 2022. Oh. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Lovely. It was, uh, well, I think I had two questions. So what your, uh, you, both of you answered uh, my last question was uh, kind of your subjective view on the, uh, on what you think what you think, whether the risks of using AI advantageous or at a disadvantage for um, for the world at the moment, whether this is in governance or or so on and so forth. But my question was actually towards you, uh, Robert. You were using that uh, neighborhood 2022 chatbot. Um, I wanted to understand what was the intermediary of using chatbot GBT because um, I, from my, what I understand of what you explained, you, you had built this. But was this chatbot GBT using an intermediary for NLP, semantic analysis? Um, were you building decision trees and so on and so forth? I'd just like to get a little bit more information on, yeah, on how so, you built this. So we originally started like with, you know, with uh, language models, you know, uh, you know, just using sort of text embeddings, uh, you know, sort of 2017, 2018. You know, we started to use uh, like BERT, which is sort of one of the first sort of last language models, you know. But when it comes to the chatbot, it's super simple. It's totally open source, and even if it's a sort of part of your priorities uh, uh, repo, the the API and the web app are totally separate. If if somebody wants to try it out with for some other citizen applications, platforms, or whatever, so it's super simple, and uh, it is basically uh, using a vector database. So what we do is that uh, when a project uh, you know decides to use the chatbot, everything in the project is indexed and goes into so-called so vector database. As, as you were mentioning, then you turn all the words into tokens and the numbers. But it means that when I put in a search query, I can search the, uh, my neighborhood 2022 locally. I don't need to search. I don't put any information to GPT-4 or anything like that. And then we get the search back. And then I should just stick it into the prompt to send GPT-4. It's almost like saying, you know, it's like in, on ChatGPT, you know, that you know, you copy paste like three ideas in there yourself and then ask, you know, GPT-4 to contemplate on them. And this means that there's also no hallucinations, you know, because you get hallucinations from those models when you ask them about something that they don't know about. But if you're always filling their context with the answer, then they never hallucinate. You know, they don't have any scope for doing it. 
hope it answered partly the question. Very good. Any, any other question? Come on, yeah, but you, <laughs> but oh. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, I was kind of trying to translate in my head what was being said. I, I guess I think of with machine learning, there's like expansion and collapse that can happen. And I'm interested in complex systems and I feel it's really important when expansion is happening and collapsing is happening to know when that's happening. And I was hearing sometimes like decisions are a sort of collapse of possibility and that's bad to involve them there. But summarization is also a collapse. I guess I was just wondering like where, do you have thoughts on like, like it feels like expansion to me, the ideating actually feels safe because a bullshit idea we can just be like, not interesting, but if it's nice, if it combined it in a neat way, it can inspire us. Uh, so I, I guess I'm just wondering your thoughts on like expansion of possibility and collapse of possibility and where the safe spots or dangerous spots are in that or even if it's a useful concept. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, it's uh, the both. Well, in, in principle, it looks like collapse is bad, especially because we are a collapsing civilization. But um, great. <laughs> but maybe it's not too bad. And as you mentioned, any 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 decision, any constraint, any commitment is uh, is a collapse of the possibilities. Uh, and this is important in democracy. This is why uh, what the, the the Greeks discovered as hubris is the is when you collapse all the possibilities and you commit to something maybe it's wrong ah and then uh, but this is essential for learning and everything and um May, I, I don't think artificial intelligence should do the job of collapsing. I think we humans are very good at collapsing. Uh, but uh, maybe it can facilitate, maybe it, it, it can remind us what, where are we living out, things like that. Proliferation or expansion, uh, we are really good at that too. I mean, you know, my priority is 700 proposals. It's impossible to read all of them. Uh, but maybe some I intermediate uh, uh, navigation of all this uh, diversity can be guided by artificial intelligence. Uh, I don't know. I, I, Robert, you, you, you have more experience on that. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. I, I, I'd say like on expanding, you know, I think, I mean, I mean, one thing is like, you know, the risk of human agency. That's like, we don't want to, we're always going to make that tax because, you know, I mean, that doesn't stupefy it. So like you were saying, and that will totally dis you know, disassociate us from like, you know, when we have the AI sort of like, you know, to literally doing our thinking for us. I mean, that's one aspect. But, but the other one, I mean, which is even as important as just because even if GPT-4 is so smart, you know, then it's, it's just not as smart, or smart as like the collective intelligence, you know? But I think the other principle will always be there. But it is still safe in terms of like, and what we found the middle ground is that when we have the human sourced ideas, to apply the genetic algorithm, to evolve new populations of ideas, to recombine them, to mutate them, and so on, that's a totally safe exploration. Mm -hmm. All right, we are done. Thanks a lot. Uh, hopefully, you'll reach yeah. these guys in the coffee. And thanks a lot. Yeah.